one of the most dramatic climate change events observed in marine and ice core records is the Younger Dryas, a return to near glacial conditions that punctuated the last deglaciation. High resolution, continuous glaciochemical records newly retrieved from central Greenland record the chemical composition of the Arctic atmosphere at this time. The record shows that both the onset and the termination of the Younger Dryas occurred within 10 to 20 years, and that massive, frequent, and short-term, meaning a decade or less, changes in atmospheric composition occurred throughout this event. The magnitude and complexity of the soluble species record documented in the Younger Dryas portion of the Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2 core provide evidence of an extremely dynamic atmosphere thus far unparalleled in the Holocene. And I hope by now most of our regular listeners know what the Holocene is. It's the present period of post-glacial warmth that we've been enjoying for 10,000 years, basically, which is now actually dated to have begun 11,600 years ago. And he's saying that when we look at the, the, the atmospheric changes that occurred during the Younger Dryas, which marks that transition from full glacial mode to interglacial mode, we don't find any parallel to it throughout the 11,000 years of the Holocene. You know, my interest in the Younger Dryas goes back, again, literally to the 1980s. Um, you know, that's when I became aware of it, when I really became obsessed with this Pleistocene-Holocene transition and the events. And then, of course, when uh, the Greenland Ice Sheet Project uh, results first got published in the early 90s, that's when I was in the thick of this. And so that that timing was, was very uh, auspicious in a sense. And so I you know, immediately grasped upon that and, and saw the, the, these extraordinary dramatic changes that had occurred throughout the, the, the end of the Ice Age, the late Pleistocene, and, you know, became obsessively intrigued by what I was seeing. And, you know, that seemed to fit in everything else that I had been looking at, whether it was the Carolina Bays now or the melting ice sheets or the mass extinction of the megafauna. Now, of course, we have this climatic record that is showing um, this precise correlation. And, and I think it was the week, episode before last where I pulled up the three graphs, right? One of the graphs was the mortality graph that showed the spike of extinctions that pretty much was centered on the Younger Dryas. It showed the two um, sea level rises, Meltwater Pulse 1A, Meltwater Pulse 1B. If you didn't see that, go back and look at it. It's on there. Um, and then the third thing was the dramatic climate shifts, the warming, the first warming, uh, which now is dated at about 14,006, then the plunge into glacial cold at 12,900, and then the second spike of massive warming at 11,600. And so we have this correlation now between climate, dramatic climate changes, mass extinction of the melt of, of the megafauna, collapse of the ice sheets, and rapid sea level rise. So, you know, what's the explanation? What's been missing in all of this is an integrating theory, some, some theory that can actually link all those things together. And, you know, if you're going around thinking that the megafauna were exterminated by paleo-Indian hunters, well, then, you know, then the rapid sea level rise has nothing to do with that. Um, you know, or, or, or these rapid climate changes... Once those rapid climate changes, though, became apparent, that really was a big blow to the, to the human predation hypothesis because now people maybe even, you know, I think if you look in the 60s and the 70s, you pretty much see that that was more or less the accepted theory as to the extinction. That Vague on details, but basically humans were responsible for the mass extinction. When those Greenland ice core records and uh, marine records, which confirmed and supported the ice core records, showed these massive 
uh, climatic fluctuations, and they're coinciding precisely with the, the, the megafaunal disappearance. Well, what that did was provided a lot of um, evidence in favor that, that you see now more, more paleontologists looking at the possibility that, well, maybe it was climate change rather than um, human predation that caused. However, when you, my question is, okay, well, yeah, you had this climate change, right? These dramatic swings of climate of, of up to 10 or 12 degrees centigrade within less than a decade. In fact, further studies of those ice cores have shown that, that in some cases it was less than five years, right? We're talking about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a massive temperature shift, right? So the problem is, okay, we could say, well, climate caused the mass extinction. But then what caused, what's driving those climate changes? See, it was almost like, well, wait a second, guys, time out. Okay, now we've got human predation on one hand, climate change on the other. But nobody's explaining what's driving these huge climate swings. Where's that at? See, that's where I thought, well, we need to start thinking, expand our thinking a little bit. You know, be willing to look at some more outrageous ideas because I'm sorry, exclusive reference to modern processes and scales and rates of modern processes aren't doing the job of explaining this stuff. That was the problem. Absolutely. Because I think what we're going to try to do is, 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 is present the, the idea that that younger Dryas is like the curtain that came down on 150,000 years or 200,000 years of human history. And until we raise that curtain, we're not going to be able to see what was going on there other than, uh, you know, uh, just the increments that are, uh, that are left to us in various forms. And so we should certainly be exploring some of that kind of evidence that, you know, the kind of stuff that Graham Hancock is doing, because he's looking at the evidence for, an ice age civilization, right? What you see with the critics of Graham is, is basically the same posturing all the time. Is that, well, it's mostly speculative and we don't have the hard evidence. You know, where, where is the remains of the skyscrapers and the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the airplanes and the, assuming that an advanced culture has to look like our own. Right. It doesn't. I don't think it does. I think there could have been parallel paths of, del uh, you know, cultural evolutionary development that really don't even look anything like ours. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then given the extremity of the planetary remodeling that has occurred, not just at the end of the last ice age, although that was certainly the most recent and some of the most severe, we can see these kinds of remodeling episodes occurring periodically as we go back to tens of thousands of years and hundreds of thousands of years. And each catastrophe tends to obscure and obliterate the world that existed before. And the catastrophe of, of the younger Dryas and the termination of the Pleistocene into the Holocene was profoundly catastrophic. And it was a major planetary remodeling event, if you will. And so and as, as we go through this series, people will be able to get the sense themselves as we go through point by point looking at, at vast areas that we now know have been completely demolished and replaced, right? Um, people will begin to get the sense, I think, that, oh, well, yeah, okay. So the question now becomes is, is how did anything actually endure across that? transition. And a lot of the critics have attacked the catastrophic scenarios because I think some of the catastrophic scenarios have been oversimplified. And then the critics will take those kind of, it's the straw man thing. They will take those oversimplified scenarios and they'll say, well, if it's an impact, it should have just been one thing all at once. And then it would have been all over. Whereas we actually see that the, that the climate shifted several times there or the, um, the megafauna were already in decline before 12,000, which in some cases is true, yes. But that doesn't rule out the possibility of a protracted series 
of events. And then we're going to get into analyzing that too. When we look at the, the, the neo-catastrophist ideas, which are the ideas that, um, yeah, impacts onto earth are way more um, uh, frequent than, than anybody had previously imagined. And when you begin to start paying attention to the amount of cosmic debris that we're now constantly seeing flying by the earth, you know, it raises questions. It raises questions about frequency, um, raises questions about periodicity. Um, when we look below our feet and we discover that the planetary surface is, is littered, is pockmarked with hundreds of scars of great impacts. And when we understand that the, the, the record of biological life on planet Earth is one of constant repeated interruptions with no particular explanation within the normal models of incremental Darwinian evolution through natural selection, right? When we look and realize now that there's been these repeated massive climate changes that have occurred in just a few years that are 10 times greater, 10 times greater than what we've seen in the last 150 years, in spite of what certain factions are saying that we are in the midst of this unprecedentedly rapid climate change right now. No, these people have not studied paleoclimatology, so they're not aware of the fact that, yeah, at the Balling Alarad Younger Dryas, there was a, a t an 18 degree Fahrenheit warming, perhaps in less than three years, right? At, at the, at the um, end of the Younger Dryas, the Younger Dryas Preboreal, which was the second warming spike, very similar. Same thing again. See, the, the, the amelioration of the deep cold of the Younger Dryas wasn't some elongated, slow process. It was like that, see? So how do we explain that stuff? Well, I think that, that, that right now we're, we've got to come to terms with the fact that we are living on a vulnerable planet. And from time to time, this planet is susceptible to these catastrophic trigger events. And not only have these events caused the extinction of species in the biological record, they're probably also the cause of the extinction of civilizations in the cultural record. 